Hello, friends, and welcome to the Optimized Advisor Podcast, where we focus on optimizing the well-being and best practices of insurance and financial professionals today. On this show, our objective is to help you optimize your life, optimize your profession, and learn from other optimized advisors. I'm your host, Scott Heinela. We hope you enjoy the show. Today's episode is fun and informative. With our guest, I dove into Botox, testosterone, hormonal therapies, anti-aging strategies, aging gracefully, or is it aging in vanity? You listen and decide. The featured guest on today's show is Dr. Taylor Poli, facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon, also an expert in hormonal therapies for both male and female. Enjoy. Hello, Dr. Taylor Poli. Good to see you. Likewise. Great to be here. Thank you for coming in this afternoon. <sighs> Love it. We've got lots to Love talk it. about. We got so much. We got, what, yeah. three hours, four hours worth? We do. Absolutely. Go. So good thing you got some H2O in your, in your glass it. there. Tell me a little bit about you, your practice. What kind of doctor are you as we segue into some very, very interesting topics that you and I want to dive into? Great. So 40-year-old, white, male, pretty standard, facial plastic surgeon, we always give our own little kind of medical intro to patients. That's mine. Um, been here starting my own facial plastic surgery practice from scratch since 2015. So going on year five-ish, six-ish. Um, wife, four kids, live in Ladera Ranch, which we have discussed is pretty much Mayberry. Yeah, totally. Just in its own little pocket, and we love yeah. it. It's um, a beautiful place to live. Oh, we live here for a reason. I grew up in Fountain Valley. Are you familiar with where Fountain Valley, Valley is? Yeah, okay. Very. So the tagline of Fountain Valley is a nice place to live. Ladera's should be a nicer place to live. Touché. Or the nicest place to live. <laughs> With all caps. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we love it. Um, kids are integrated. My wife's got her friends. We have our church groups and sports groups. It's, we've got our gym buddies. It's, it's amazing. Um, I was up in Beverly Hills for two years prior to really digging into my practice here. And before that, it was a back and forth across the country, college, BYU, med school out in Philly, residency, Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, and then fellowship for facial plastics in New York. And it was kind of a no-brainer for us, where do we want to go? Southern California. And it's not just because this is a, a great market for plastic surgery. It's just a great place to live in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wife happy, kids happy. I love it. Uh, patients are fantastic. But to kind of respond to the second of your question, what I do is mostly or entirely just kind of making people's lives better, in this case, surgically. So non-surgical stuff like Botox and filler included. But most of what I do is like eyelid surgery, facelifts, rhinoplasty, neck lift, brow lift. Um, and then not to segue yet, but then adding in a little bit more kind of wellness, health, um, hormone related stuff that kind of goes hand in hand with the plastic surgery world as well. And would that be more of an intro, more of a recent introduction into your practice? I mean, that's an ever evolving, rapidly changing it space. It is. It is. And so what's fascinating is I, I mean, you have to, in the plastic surgery world, but especially in the medical world, you decide early. Like, I mean, I had a picture, my mom and dad brought this down when they came to visit two years ago, but I drew myself age 10 in second grade um, or fifth grade, excuse me, getting paged to the operating room and I drew myself in scrubs. So, okay. I mean, I knew I was going to be wearing pajamas for a living, even at that point. And I wasn't sure exactly the specialty or whatever, but my OCD and personality, it lends itself well to what I do. So, and it's great because there's no, there's not many insurance constraints. I can spend as much time with patients as I want. It's more kind of like concierge level. We do it because we want to do it. Patient has a need. I provide a service. We make it happen. Life's amazing. But, um, jumping into the surgical world, you have to start at a young age. I mean, your college years, your high school years have to lend to getting into college, which then lends to getting into medical school. And then that gets you into fellowship and residency. And then, but then you get to a point where you're kind of locked in. Yeah. So the surgical world, the training builds up to it. And then, I mean, I couldn't really change and become a financial advisor. I mean, I could, you could but, but it's just a little tough. Whereas in the hormone kind of wellness world, it lends itself well because it is such an evolving, changing pocket of yeah. the health wellness field. Right. But doing what I do kind of puts me on a level where so much of the advice given, so much of the treatment planning is straightforward. But when you're talking controlled substance, I mean, there's legal regulatory stuff and I right. automatically meet that, you know, that 
call it a, a bar to clear yeah. um, out of the gate. Well, and there's so much of this product that's available over the counter. Totally. You know, I was starting to go down that rabbit hole the other day, actually. Most, most people start down the rabbit hole and some oh do it. Gosh. Some actually jump in and they're regretful. They have issues. They develop side effects, whatever. Others, they just don't get outcomes they're looking for. And then I have to, as I talk to them, I say, well, you know, what were you expecting? And they're usually expecting, kind of like in my surgical world, patients are expecting a surgical result from a non-surgical treatment. Mm. And we have to like keep expectations real. Right. The same thing here. I mean, when you're talking controlled substances with risks, I mean, it has to be a risk benefit discussion, yeah. but it has to also be expectations lined up yeah. correctly. So I, I want to go back for a second. Okay. At an early age, go. you recognized that you wanted to be a physician, physician. doctor yeah. in some capacity. Correct. As you reflect back now, on your seniority. At age 40, it, how, senior. How, yeah, do, do, you, do you have a, yeah, how, do you, how did you, I mean, as you reflect back, how did you make that decision or what came to the realization that doctor was what you were gonna be? You know, Is there any? Uh, good question. I, I don't remember a specific moment. I did have a pediatrician when I was growing up that I respected and looked up to, Dr. Carr, with two R's, great guy. But I mean, it's hard to respect someone that just like has his nurse give you vaccinations mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, checks your throat when you have strep. That's so interesting but, because our pediatrician was a family friend and remained as a family friend well into my teen years. Um, and he was just this wonderful man. They, they kind of have to be, like to yeah. do what they do on a daily basis. And then I did have a, um, a buddy moved into the neighborhood. His dad was a plastic surgeon, Dr. Allred, Bryce Allred, and really nice guy. Um, and so I remember kind of looking at, at Dr. Allred and saying, okay, that seems pretty cool. Mm. It's being a doctor, but also kind of that technician, I can't, you know, kind of blue collar background family, you know, that technician background, what I do surgically, mm. I mean, it lends itself well to that personality. So there's a little business in there. There's a little technician, there's a little physician and provider kind of all blended into one. Wow. So as you're going through med school and all that, how did it finally take shape that you end up as a Facial plastic, plastic surgeon. Yeah, so it's a pretty targeted, you know. I mean, it's an ocean. Of... It, it is. It's a total ocean. And it's funny, I'll actually, there's a lot of friends, colleagues, or like nurses in the OR, actually one just last week, a nurse in the OR whose um, son is wanting to go to med school, maybe. Or someone like an attorney in our neighborhood that we go to church with. His son wants to go to med school, maybe. And sometimes they enlist me to convince them not to. Other times they enlist me to just give data. And if you ask my wife, she'd say, H, no, don't you dare. And I try right. to be a little more glasses half full. But I mean, if you look at medicine in general, there's like the physician level, and then there's the, you know, PA nurse practitioner level, there's the more like caregiver nurse, you know, tech level. And if you decide you want to be on that, you know, level of the food chain, the physician right. level, then you decide, do I want to deal with kids or adults or all of the above? Do I want to think all the time? Or do I want to do something practical with my hands? Do I want to have you know, just a subset of really sick patients or do I like healthy? Do I want to never interact with humans and be a radiologist or a pathologist and just look at, you know, autopsies and slides of tissue pieces? And in my case, I knew from the beginning, I like people. I mean, it's, I like having that technical skill. And in the plastic surgery world, we really, you have to know early because the board scores, the grades, the honors in certain classes, you have to check those boxes right. and jump those hurdles. Otherwise you're just kind of disqualified. Mm. So is there any distinct advantage? So our predominant, I mean, we would love for anybody and everybody to be listening to these shows, but our focus is predominantly financial advisors, wealth totally. managers, some of which who you know that we're friends with. And so with that, there's definitely some over oversight. So, or overlap, if you will. If I'm going to start out my career as a financial advisor, obviously I start very, very high level. Do I want to work with business owners, retirees? From there, I start to drill down into subsets, what type of businesses, what type of net worth and affluency, regions, you know, what, how do these people exist? What makes them tick and all of that. So you started at this very, very high level of you're saying, you know, what are the highest level of categories that I want to get into? And then I just kind of drill down Correct. and to get more acute, more acute to where you are today. Correct. So uh, with that, I, I, the thought I have is, you know, use an analogy of like a CPA, there's pros and cons or advantages of disadvantages of working with the more experienced, you know, senior CPA versus a younger, you know, more innovative, fresh ideas, hard charging CPA. There's trade-offs to both. 
is that the same case as it relates to physicians? Because you know, I imagine technology is changing, obviously, at a very, very rapid pace. So it is. And if I've been in practice for 30 years, yeah. are my, am I really embracing change and innovation? And it's hard because with certain fields of medicine, like if you're the type, like a primary care doctor that's prescribing a lot of medication, well, the diabetes medications that are out today are light years different than 20 years ago but I'm still using the same surgical same steel instrument. Like, I mean, a scalpel blade is not gonna change. I mean, it's ergonomically perfect. It's weighted nicely. I mean, some of these, like, I even looked at one the other day, it says made in East Germany. Like, dude, East Germany hasn't been around for how long? Right. But there's not a lot of change in some regard, but at the same time, because of the recent, you know, just how society is, the tech boom, the microwave society, there's a huge amount of change. And so yeah. there's trends, but at the same time, there's kind of a stable base. Interestingly, I have patients that love me because, I mean, I'm chill. I'll walk in, I'll talk to them like their family, right. like I'll tell them straight up and I won't BS them. But at they the same time- They send you time, a Christmas card? Oh, totally. Like, yeah. or, they, or they're like, paint me like in the office with the gals, yeah. watercolor. It's really, really cool. It's actually, that, that's what makes my day. Great flattery. It, it's fun. Yeah. But then they will also, like, I'll even sometimes apologize. I'll be like, hey, I apologize for being so informal. They're like, no, I, I love it. I was just in a consult last week with the opposite, like mm -hmm. older, stiffer, you know, Very like, stoic. Yes. Yeah. And and to me, I mean, that's, I'll get the phone call from my friends or family saying, hey, I said a, a physician, this type of physician, and uh, I, I was left lacking ABC. And so I'll say, well, here's what they meant to say. Here's what they wanted to say. Had they had more time, they would have said this. They could have communicated this better. Yeah. Because bedside manner is still, I mean, that's what made Marcus Welby MD so like beloved by the American culture right. decades ago, that same you, you can look in the eye and talk and, and give an honest, yeah. you know, obviously business is business. You know, I'd rather be operating on someone than not, but if they're not a surgical candidate or surgery is not going to fix A, B, or C, well, that's the worst thing for them. So yeah. you got to have that open, honest communication. And I find being 40, like in this age, you know, I'm young enough, but not too young. I'm experienced, but not too experienced. You know, I'm not right. kind of set in my ways. Yeah. I'm still pretty flexible in how I do things. And I took some from my fellowship that I loved and some I kind of discarded from my time at the Mayo Clinic with different facial plastic surgeons, took some and then discarded others. And you can see how things are done, just like in your world. Ooh, I like how that turned out. Didn't like that so much. Right. And you can kind of pivot and learn and grow your practice in that regard. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, just a fun mention, this will be a little bit laugh, but um, you know, Dr. Benderov? I do. So, and his procedure mm -hmm. where the stoic exam, I, you, tell it me works. what it's called. It works. What is the old version uh, uh, when you get your uh, your tubes tied, so to speak, as a male? So, I mean, <laughs> what's the traditional procedure? Vasectomy. Yes, vasectomy. Thank you. So he doesn't do the traditional vasectomy procedure. It's just literally like ten minutes. Lock in, snip, laser, next. It's unbelievable. But you think of it as like, oh my gosh, this is a horrible situation. You know, oh, it, hours long. Can't walk for weeks. Yeah, you think about how many males, men are, are so fearful of going through that process to get a vasectomy when you can just tap into a technology utilized by somebody like him and decreased downtime, decreased everything. Yeah. My wife came in because we were thinking, oh, she's gonna have to drive me home and all that. And she comes into the room and sits down and has a book and everything. She thought she was gonna be there a while. We weren't there 10 minutes. Like ready to go. She's like, no, 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 no. That's not what this is <laughs> going like to be. It's like the DMV calling you right away. Yeah. Like, no, I expected more. Uh, anywho, technology is a friend, right? It is. It totally properly is. properly utilized in the hands of the right physician, let's just say. Perfect. So moving on to, to um, male hormone therapy. Uh, Even real quick tangent though on the side. So a lot of times what I do, and I do facial plastic surgery, kind of a separate, its own individual subset compared to plastic surgery. Usually people will think plastic surgery like breast augmentation, tummy tuck, of course. Um, liposuction, all the above. And then, you know, the non-surgical stuff, like I mentioned, Botox filler, laser resurfacing. In my case, like I mentioned, I do mostly the cosmetic facial plastic stuff. And I've um, colleagues that do more of the body that we work together and, right. and coordinate and it works out perfect. But interestingly, um, you Does mentioned that, that exist? That, go ahead, finish your thought. Well, there's a male-female split, and a lot of people think that plastic surgery is a female thing. And I mean, so it's funny. I actually had a patient back in the OR, or in the office today who's one week out. He is one week out from a, a facelift and doing his eyelids and some fat transfer to his cheeks. 
I want to say that cultural shift is kind of occurring too. So kind of before we segue into the hormone stuff, I think the male market for facial plastic surgery, and I mean, I have a bunch of male patients that do Botox, they do filler, we do their eyelids, you know, that little heavy eyelid skin is aging them or that like under eye bagging is aging them or that little jowling is aging them. Whereas before you're like, I'm going to age gracefully like Sean Connery. Well, he probably had something done. That's why he's aging gracefully. But it's that stigma kind of removed years ago from the female side. I do think that stigma is removing more and more in today's world from the male side. So I have more male patients, it, like so facelifting, you know, the lower face, neck surgery, incisions by the ears, lift all that jowling stuff. Don't make you look like you're like crazy, mm -hmm. but just make you look youthful, rejuvenated. Yeah. That was like a 97 female to three male 20 years ago. It's now more like a 75, 25. Male, what, female? 75 female, 25 male. But okay. what was 97, three, three has now shifted. Yeah. So it was, you know, before a tremendous difference. And now, you know, like a you know, 30 to one. Mm. And now it's not, it's interesting how- Are that, most of your clients today males? No, they're mostly female, but they I, they're okay. shocking. So is it 75, 25 or it, in that it realm? It is, it really is. Okay. It's fascinating okay. though. Yeah, that is fascinating. Are all plastic surgeons geographically located equal? So what I mean not by that- Not at all. No, okay. No, I mean, so you would have to have like in Lexington, Kentucky or the thereabout region, an area that's like a hundred miles square to, to support a practice as opposed to in beverly hills when i was up there i had my my rep would show up for like botox or filler and they they would say that they could stand on the roof of the building i was in two-story little you know italian building and they could see every one of their accounts oh just like within gosh. whereas even down here it's like Starbucks. they're gonna have to drive correct you're gonna have to drive like 20 30 minutes to hit their whole region there it's like a block two square wow. blocks. So it, I would guess it's similar in the, the financial advisor world. You're going to have pockets where there's more of a need and pockets where there's less. But in ours, it's more hands-on. I mean, people are going to travel for surgeries and things, but they still want to be in their community when possible. Okay. So let's stay on that path. There's a lot to talk Isn't about Isn't this fun? This I told you really three fun. hours. Absolutely. You were expecting less. But. Sheesh. We're going to have to do more of this. So let's start. In, I would imagine in all this preservation of age. Okay. Uh, process for males in particular, I would imagine there's stages, right? So yeah. at what age do I, do your customers start walking in the door and what does it begin with? So, you know, the like easy one would be like, do drug? men do use Botox? Totally. Yes, obviously they do, but- But you often for, don't know, for, you don't realize. For, correct. Okay. So, I mean, and to be honest, this is where as a person, I'll look and say, I always say when patients walk in, what bothers you? Because I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to you know, that, that douchebag that says, oh, let me guess, you're bothered by your nose. And they're like, actually, I love my nose. I hate my eyelids. And you're like, and you're like oh, it's just like, oh, how far, how, how far along are you? Um, I'm not pregnant. You know, right. oh, crap, can't do that. Yeah. So it's always a, what bothers you? What are you here for? And usually they'll have a friend, a family member, a, you know, someone they know, or they'll just do a lot of doctor Googling, which has its own risks. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. And you don't know what to trust and what not to trust. Yeah. And they'll come in and they'll say, you know, like for dudes, they'll say, I don't like these lines. They kind of make me look angry. Others yeah. say, oh, they make me look distinguished. Well, clearly Botox is not for them. Botox right. or, you know, it's just the brand name, but neurotoxin killing like the lines when you frown or lift or around the eyes. Others, they come in and say, I look really kind of hollow and sunken in my cheeks. And I say, well, that's something that filler would treat, you know, adding volume. It's a natural substance in your body. It's just, you know, produced commercially and we pull it out of a box and put it in your face. And then there's those patients that come in and say, you know, that upper eyelid skin is really hovering and sagging. Sometimes it's a functional thing, like it's kind of blocking vision. That's yeah. usually like 70s, 80s. But going back to your your comment at our age. But it could be in the 50s, It could be in right? the 30s. Oh, Like I've had wow. patients in there. I had a, Where their eyelids... Come well, on. not where it's blocking vision, but where right, it, bother, but it bothers. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because we're all so hypercritical of ourselves. Gravity is beginning to take its yeah. force. And gravity is that thing. I mean, naturally, you're going to get loss of tissue. Like, I mean, if you look at a 90-year-old male compared to a 40-year-old male, just the tissue, the face, the fat, the everything, even the bone structure, yeah. if you take a skeleton face from a 90-year-old and a 30-year-old, there's going to be a big difference. Just that bone resorbs. So oh, that's not helping. Of course. And then the tissue kind of just softens and atrophies, we call it. Well, that's not helping. Then gravity is the big one. Yeah. So that's why most of our procedures are to lift or remove extra. So like brows, lifting the brows. For a lot of guys, it's more masculine to have that low brow. If a woman has it, they look masculine or they look heavy or tired. So right. we lift the brow surgically, conservatively, and they're good. 
But going back to your question about the guys, it's usually Botox for those little lines because they don't want to get etched in. Right. Or filler for the areas of volume. Or, I mean, there's guys that a want scowl. Lip like filler, I always look pissed. Or, yeah. Which and I don't some, always want to look pissed. Which some guys want to look like that. Like yeah. that's their job. That's their right, hard-nosed right. persona and it works. So it sounds crazy. Something that takes 20, 30 minutes mm. and it's a few little needle pokes, assuming you can tolerate it, lasts for three months, depending, a little more, a little less, depending on how metabolically active you are. Right. And you're good. And that is something that can be done in a preventative way to go back to what you mentioned or therapeutic for some, like I'll have guys that come in and women that come in in their twenties and they say, well, I want Botox and they don't have really etched in lines yet. Like we have in our forties, but they do have that beginning. And so I'll do a low dose Botox and it just means it's, their goal is a little different. Their goal is I don't want to get to where I see my mom, grandma, aunt, uncle, whatever, and they start early. Same thing with filler to a degree. I mean, if anything overdone can be too much. So like too much lip filler. I mean, that's that person that you're walking around Fashion Island and my wife's like, don't look behind you, but I'm like, oh, come on. You know, no, I got to look. And you know, it's going to be someone that looks odd, looks off, looks unnatural because our eyes pick up on that pretty well. For sure. So we can avoid that. And in the dude world, especially because most men don't want to look feminized. They don't want to look artificial. So is there a way to do filler or neurotoxin, Botox tastefully, conservatively? Yeah. All day long. And that's kind of that market that you wouldn't realize is there. They're probably buddies of yours. Right. They just don't tell you because it's, there's a little bit of a taboo-ish yeah. to it still. Yeah. Do, do you feel it should be taboo? No. No. I mean, it's no different than getting braces to straighten your teeth, you know, getting your hair colored or like shaving your beard or grooming your beard. I yeah. mean, if you have the desire to wear a nice pressed shirt and groom your beard, what's the difference? Like, I mean, certain things, and we were mentioning this before briefly, certain things you can do yourself, certain things you can't. Like you can do your hair, you can, you know, brush your teeth, you can take care of your skin, you can Mm. wear your clothes how you want, you can work out and exercise and get your body where you want it, but you can't remove extra skin or shouldn't. You can't, you know, inject your own Botox or shouldn't. You shouldn't be lifting your face and neck and jowls surgically. So you hit the point where you can't help anymore. So therefore, that's where I come in. So Botox is the brand name. Correct. Of like ner- Zoom conferencing. Correct. There's many so other versions of teleconference. Zoom conference. For, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So neurotoxin. And is all created equal? Ish. I Ish. mean, there's different brand little I mean, is there like a gold standard of... of no. And I have patients more, that prefer one over the other. Really? And another patient that will, provide, that will prefer B over A or wow. one A over B. There, I, I tend to use in my practice a little more Dysport as opposed to Botox. Right. Hopefully there's no Allergan spies on the line right now. Right, right, right. Um, but it's just because I find it works better for the patient population I have. The young, active, heavy, high metabolizer in the gym crushing it. And they find that it kicks in a little quicker, lasts a little longer. Sign me up. Better value. Um, Xeomin is another one. Um, Javo is a new, is one that's been out a short amount of time. Okay. So there's, and there's a, always there's... a couple in the pipeline, but Botox give Allergan credit. They came out early and they built just like rollerblade or zoom conference or, yep, you yep. know, Kleenex. Right. They've got that name brand recognition. Wow. Interesting. But usually patients aren't married to the brand. And especially if we have that doctor patient relationship, they'll trust what I say. And the best part is there is to a degree of trial and error. Some say, I want to get really not, I want to knock that muscle out. And I'm like, okay, I tend to be more conservative and this is why they're pretty quick to understand the why and they'll change their thought process a little based on what we discuss from a medical perspective. But it still comes back to that same, what bothers you? How do we address it? So it's not an anti-aging. It's a maybe it's preservation of age. I mean, because so think of it as a, a lightening belt. of muscle tensioning is what it's yeah. doing. So like I, I'll have patients have like you have that one big yep. heavy right down I the do. middle. That's not to, it. That's the scalp. Hopefully, hopefully the camera's getting. No, 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 no. It's good. So it's there. <laughs> so technically, if we and your little crow's feet around your eyes. Yes. I mean, not bad. That's just. I like the crow's feet. Okay, so what the, I don't, we what, what touch I the crow's prefer feet. without it would be this, and you, you know, have your, just because it's a scowl. And you have your hat on so we can't see the forehead, but a lot of guys, it's the forehead lines when they get etched in or that kind of scowl. And your kids will be like, dad, why are you mad? And you're like, I'm not mad, but now I am because right. you're saying I'm mad, yeah, I'm mad yeah. kind of thing. So that's where neurotoxin, and I'll totally. use that term as the umbrella where Botox, Dysport, Zium, and Javo, and then there's others that are on their way out. Some have been used in Europe for years, the FDA approval process, you know, you get it all, the R&D yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we use that, though, I could get rid of that line, but three-ish months later, it's going to come back, and you're going to have that activity back, so yeah. we just hit it again. Right. So the neurotoxin itself doesn't last for more than three months, but the cumulative benefit of it done 
makes a difference. So, I mean, even that might stay etched in. I might need to put a little filler to fill it in. Right. But probably after two or three sessions of neurotoxin, it softens. It'd be flat all the way, or if not, soften tremendously. And that's the end point most want. Wow. But then you have to decide, is this something I want to do for life? Right. I want to do it for a short window. If you took a 60-year-old male versus a 40-year-old male, you know, and compared them, you're going to see the difference. Now, if you have that 40-year-old use neurotoxin, you know, regularly compare him to the 60-year-old that's had nothing at age 60, there's going to be a big difference. Big difference. So it is preventative, but it's not, it's, I mean, you're on that conveyor belt of aging. If we can yeah, move yeah, you yeah. back, you'll keep aging. It's slowing it down, right? Yeah. And it keeps you more, especially in our world where patients feel younger often than they look. Right. You want to get that look, age, and feel age to line up better. Yeah. And it that can makes be, sense. It can it's be a, done. It's, psycho- it's a state of mind as well. Totally. Yeah. Wow. So what's a little bit of, of Botox, not Botox, well, so what's it, the generic term? So neurotoxin. Neurotoxin. But neurotox- I mean, it's, it's from is there a little? Is time. there too much? Is there some kind of a gauge? Well, so it's a unit based and think of a unit like a gallon or a milligram or a pound. I mean, that's okay. just the, the measurement amount. And so for back in the day when they were using it for like neck spasms, torticollis, like sometimes neurologists will inject for migraines, they'll use like 100, 200 units. Whoa. And we'll inject, which sounds heavy and it is. Whereas like for you, if I were to inject your glabella in the next five minutes, I'd put, frown down big, go, I'd probably put in like 22 Wait. units. 20, okay. Perspective, I, right before I rushed over here eating my salad, I had a gal that I did three weeks ago, never had neurotoxin before, 40, 52 year old female, works out like crazy. Yeah. I did her neurotoxin, I put in 16 units here, 14 up above and 10. The crow's feet and the frontalis, the forehead, were wonderful. But here, she still had a little bit of line edged in. It had been three weeks, which means we just underdosed. But again, we can always add more. I'd rather put on the kind of entry level side, plus that way you can see how you like it. Whereas with you, I would start at that 22, 24 units out of the gate, just based on how heavy male, you know, forehead musculature is and what you're looking to get out of it. So you said metabolic activity. Is that because of the, the indirect activity or the result of sweating that we're putting Great out or question. is it through the blood? We don't know, oh. but we find this is, and I swear we should just do some hardcore, like controlled randomized trials on this. Right. The worker outer crowd, and that's not English correct. I get it, right. but we, still. We get it, yeah. Us worker outers know that. Um, <laughs> you just tend to tear through it a little quicker, burn through it a little quicker. Interesting. So, and it could be just because you're downward dog, hot yoga, crazy heart rate elevation. So we'll tell patients no heavy working out for a day or two. Mm-hmm. You know, like don't lay on your face getting a massage because that'll put pressure. Technically, it could like diffuse and move it. I mean, that that neurotoxin stays in the muscle I inject it in, like mm-hmm. teeny little spots right up here. But if it like comes down into the eyelid, then you have what's called ptosis and you'll have that eyelid that like kind of hovers down. Oh, yeah. And people are like, what happened to your eyelid? You're like, yeah. You do was, that really yeah. well. Yeah, I, I, I practiced a couple of times. That's good. Um, or they'll have <laughs> something that like pulls a little funny and we need to fix it. So we try to hit the right dose, or at least a good guess out of the gate, and then we can modulate for future injections or even adding on like this patient I mentioned. She's three weeks out, and the movement is still a little bit there, but I told her up front, I'd rather go easy. Heaven forbid you want to add a little more. We always can, and we did, and she'll be happy, and I'll see her in three or four months, and we'll do more, and Gosh, I'm doing her eyelids in a couple of weeks, and life goes on. It's amazing. I like. I is this fun? If I was going to do this, I like, I don't want to go to a fly by night outfit. You know. Okay, like, so that's the argument. Of the or decade. a non. I know. The, the, the chop or... shop ish. Yeah. I mean, Botox of all the things, or neurotoxin. There's a little bit more flexibility. You can mess people up, but it's not permanent. Good lord, it's my face. Amen. And then filler, there's a little bit higher level of, oh, crap. I mean, if a blood vessel gets blocked and it causes issues or lumpy, bumpy asymmetry, and that's a step up. And then there's the surgical. There's a reason you can't do surgery unless you're a surgeon. But the other stuff, I mean, I have nurses in my office locations, medical spas that are fantastic. So there's a degree of vetting and a degree of experience that comes with it. But there's some that are not comfortable doing certain filler neurotoxin treatments and others that are. But it really comes down to their personality, their skill set, their experience. I mean, you know, in your world, experience is key. Yeah. I mean, what you learn after you finish with your you know, education is right. almost, if not more valuable. I mean, of everything I learned in med school, I probably use like 4%. Right. I mean, just doing what I do. It's just textbook. And, and, yeah. Like a, a primary care doctor might use 80, but as a plastic surgeon, I'm not going to use as much. Right. So then I learn based on experience, just years and years of injecting patients, cutting on patients, that kind of stuff. So what are the top three medical procedures that you're 
conducting on faces? Okay, so breaking it, cosmetic, which is about 80% of my practice, and insurance, which is about 20 in the cosmetic like side. Like elective. Elective, so cosmetic yeah. only. Yep. Insurance, Man, woman, insurance I'm coming don't care. you, and I'm like... You say, this bugs. Whew. So, I mean, I think it's... Dial good. me in, doctor. Okay, so I like when patients ask, but I even on those patients still say, well, what bothers you? Because there still 100%. has to be a, a, a give and take relationship. So I would say... I have a double chin. I don't D- double that. chin, it would be a little incision underneath, lift up the skin, take out the fat, bring the muscle together, sew it all. But isn't there these little things, like there's non-surgical... There are, and I have a lot of those in my office or med spas. Do and they really work? Depending on the like patient. freezing kind of thing? Yeah, so cool the... sculpt, which freezes, does help patient selection important. Sculpture, which kind of heats up the fat, it works. Patient selection important. Mm-hmm. Um, Kybella injecting like a detergent that dissolves the fat, it works. Patient selection important. Same thing with like Ulthera or radio frequency or ultrasound based, or even like thread lifting, like a non surgical mm-hmm. minimally invasive. It's all based on what the patient wants. If you're going to pay three, four, five thousand to get a temporary yearish of result where you're maybe 30% happy, well, I'll take a pass mm-hmm. and pay more for something that's permanent. Right. That's going to give me what, what I want. But if I just can't handle the anesthesia or the downtime is untenable, well, then I'll go the non-surgical. So it's always based on what the patient, what their expectation is, what they're willing to invest, time, energy, recovery, anesthesia, cost, everything bundled up, and then we make the decision. But that's where I come in because I can say, for you, maybe this is better based on your current situation in life, or for you, this is better. Mm. And everyone, like I'll do filler under eyes for some patients, but then I'll surgically Mm. fix it by getting them in the OR, taking out the fat, pinching the skin, taking their own fat from around their belly button and layering it in, in a more permanent way. But it's more of an aggressive procedure. I mean, recovery, downtime, swelling, bruising. You got a week or two or three of being kind of puffy, but the filler you just can do in an hour and you're done. So that's kind of the thought process. It's what serves them better. But to answer your question, I would say for the younger crowd, rhinoplasty is big. And sometimes that's an I can't breathe and, oh, I want to fix how my nose looks. Sometimes it's just I can't breathe, like, you know, boxing injuries or, you know, played soccer, deviated septum. I do that all the time. And then sometimes it's, oh, my septum's deviated and can I also fix that appearance part? I don't like the bump on my nose or whatever. And the answer is all day long, male and female. And that one, it's, you know, like 30% male, 70% female. So this is an interesting question. Can you tell by looking in someone's nose how much drugs they've used? Yeah, sometimes they do have a big hole in their septum. And and, you know right away. And I ask them and I'll say, so cocaine, they're like, and I'll see them like in their mind, they're like, do I tell him or not? He's a doctor, I should tell him. You can see help. it probably clear as day. Yeah, but to be honest, that's not the common. Some You can get the same, you know, perforation in your septum from trauma, from autoimmune diseases, from other things really? too. Yeah. So it's not like I can look and say with oh. 100% certainty that is drug use. This guy's like the booger sugar. Yes. Okay. But I have had, I had a female patient a little bit wow, ago. I looked in her nose and she had a big hole. And I said, okay. so any history of it? She's like, oh, I mean, I had a pretty you know, racy college years. I was like, enough said, was yeah. it cocaine? How much, how often have you used recently? And she's like, nothing in 15 years. It's important years. for you to know. Totally. And I'm like, if you haven't done anything in 15 years, you're not going back to it, we can fix it. Otherwise, that's another medical specialist for yeah, a window yeah, yeah. of time. And, okay. and then I fix it. Interesting. So, okay. So rhinoplasty. So rhinoplasty is big. Um, upper eyelid, blepharoplasty, we call it upper eyelid surgery. And then um, I would say probably lower facelift, neck lift. But I'm not going to do a lower facelift, neck lift on a guy like you. I mean, you got a little bit of the jowling, so do I, a little bit of stuff. Yeah, I have a little If you, came, little if you came in and said, can you operate on that? I'd say, no, I could, but I won't because you're not there yet. You'll get there at some point. That's why the gentleman I was just mentioning was 57. The gal I did that on yesterday was 55. The gal I'm doing it on next week is 50, 61. Those are kind of the ages, the 50s, 60s. 50s, 60s. But I did have a gal the other day, 48, who had a lot of that stuff. Dad was like horribly unkind genetically, and he had the big turkey neck. So she was 48, and I cut it out, sewed it up. You know, she looked 15 years younger and 20 pounds lighter just by getting rid of that neck fat stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of, I'd say, eyelids, facelift, neck lift, and rhinoplasty. But it's an age thing. Like people don't come in in their 20s saying, I want a facelift. And they usually don't come in in their 60s, 70s saying, I want a rhinoplasty, although Technically, I would and could. So there is an age, gender predominance from the cosmetic elective side. Interesting. So in our world, it's usually upper eyelids. And you got a little bit of that kind of hovering skin too. Yeah. You'd, technically, you would benefit if it bugged you enough. And then the under eyes, a lot of times it's the crepey skin. And I'll do the same. I'll pinch. I'll take out the fat underneath through the eyelid. Okay. I'll layer in some fat on the top if I need to to give a little volume. But there's ways we can do it so that your golf buddies don't say, 
dude, you look like Kenny Rogers. What the hell happened to you? Totally. I mean, you're going to look a little beat up for a couple of days. <laughs> you're like, man, I look like a million bucks now. It's, no, yeah. you really don't. That's, That's what thing. we want to avoid, right? A hundred. And okay. that, those are a lot of the patients I'll get. They'll have had something and they're like, what do we do? I'm like, sometimes we can touch and mess and fix little things, but it's better to do it right out of the gate. And I'm of now, How that. much can you kind of... <sighs> It's hard. Fix, if it's, you will. It's really hard. I will, like, so someone has a facelift and their scars are visible or their ear is tethered or, like, they have that kind of pulled down or they have a visible scar behind there. That's my peeve because that was just pure surgeon laziness. I can fix it, but I have to make new incisions, cutting out the old ones, tug, pull, lift. So it's almost like you're going back through the process again. So Man. Uh, that's why the way I view it is, and same, and it's so simple, sewing up a little kid. I'll have like urgent cares or primary docs. They'll call me up, say, hey, this kid has a huge face laceration, like on his cheek or chin. Can you sew it up? And I'm always like, oh, yeah. Or like friends, a buddy will text me or call me Sunday at 9 p.m. And I'm like, I'll meet you at the office in 10. Because to do it right out of the gate saves so much energy, as effort, hassle later on. And a lot of things you just can't. Once it's done, it's done. You just can't fix it. So I want let's use this a good example. Everyone knows Carrie Underwood. Yes. Do you know what happened to, okay, well, directly with her face? So use Carrie Underwood or use like Renee Zellweger as an example. She's another one similar where something changed. Um, but like Carrie had a fall down the stairs or something. Annie and, and uh, Danielle would, yeah. would know more of this about that. But it's like bad, apparently really bad. Okay. And you look at her face now and I'm like, I can't tell. I won't tell. So that's, well, so number one, Photoshop or airbrush or makeup and foundation. That can do a right. lot. But honestly, done correctly, like sewn up with correct surgical principles out of the gate makes a huge difference. And obviously, if you get a wound infection after, it's going to make a huge difference. Right. If you don't take care of your wounds. That, and that's why I love my cosmetic patients because they're motivated. I mean, they're paying money to have something done. They're not going to skimp. They're going to do everything plus plus. Yeah. And I love it because we're in this together. I mean, before surgery, it's their problem. After surgery, it's our problem. And I can do my part and I can counsel and, you know, put the incisions in the right spot, do it right. But there's still that patient component. So yeah. give Carrie Underwood credit. Does a great job with wound care, doing everything. Surgeon did yeah. a good job. She did a good job. Best outcome. Yeah. Wow. So on the infection, let's transition that because we got to get yeah. into that. Let's switch now to hormone therapy. Bring and I... I our predominant conversation is male, but this applies to both male and female. I mean, it does, but now this is similar to the cosmetic world that might be a little more female heavy. This is a little more male heavy, but it still benefits because we're all as concerned well. about our testosterone just falling through. And the floor. even women have a testosterone potential need as well. We'll get to that too when we talk about it. But it, it is predominantly males. So, but so eighty percent of your practice is is surgical. So that's of the surgical practice. Yep. So, yep. And then. The, and then the hormone wellness side. So I'll, I'll mention you you hinted it earlier and I'll give you the real intro. So this is something I actually never anticipated doing. I always knew of docs that did it and I was kind of like, yeah, whatever, I'm a surgeon, peace out next. Right. But I had enough buddies and whether it's, you know, friends from church or soccer team or like gym, gym the gym's a lot of them, you know, the gym, yeah, Lifetimes, yeah, we yeah. love it. It's our, it's our family. Yeah. And they would be on testosterone therapy and they're like, why am I not doing better? And yeah. I'm like, well, it's because your hemoglobin's too high. You got to go donate blood, and then we're going to give you, put you on that estrogen blocker because you got man boobs that are starting. And they didn't check this, you know, sex hormone binding globulin. They only checked your total testosterone. And oh no, you're injecting every three weeks at that dose. No, it needs to be. And these are not like hard concepts, kind of like in your world. I mean, there's some pretty tried and true methods that are going to get pretty good results. Yeah. Now you can you can 10x it by adding on that bonus. Or like, oh, you also should be on HCG because your nuts are starting to shrink. Look at this hormone level. Your FSH level's low. That shows ABC. And so these guys would be like, well, I'm seeing this clinic in no naming names, like certain other parts Wherever of Southern California. Yep, yep. And they're like, but what can I do different? I'm like, I'm um, everything. So it kind of fell into my lap. And I was actually going to, this is going to sound funny. I was actually going to add to my surgical practice, like hair restoration, you know, for the thinning hair, yep. like kind of balding dudes. I'll put a lot of them on. I like, have that problem. Yeah, we have that problem. So we'll work on that together in okay. the future. But that was going to be the plan for this year. But it got bumped because there was just such a fortuitous need for this. Yeah. And honestly, it doesn't take a plastic surgeon to do it. But a lot of them were going to their primary care, their like their OBGYN for the women or, you know, whatever. And they just weren't, they weren't Ex optimized. Right. I mean, to use like... I yes, mean, it's, optimized it's the, advisor. It, it really you are. is. That's the goal. So like you yeah. can be on the therapy, but there's a difference between taking it and maximizing your benefit. Because often they're on the right so, thing. There's not on the right dosage, the right frequency, the right blood work isn't being checked. Allowing so, myself to be vulnerable. Please would be. Would we look at my 
Oh uh, my gosh, I would love to. Okay. Full disclosure, I've not looked at this playbook so, before. No, no, at all. This is this is so. New. This was when I turned forty ish. Okay. So it's fact, right? Testosterone. And how old are you now? Depletes. Um, you don't no, have to no, say no, no, if you don't no, want no. to say. Actually, but. this was much younger. So this was in 2016. So, you know, five years ago, I was 36 Okay. when so I had 41. this first done. And okay. I was kind of bamboozled into this, by the way. By? My wife. Fair. That's actually yeah. common. They often say, check this out. Yeah. You could do better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's my labs from 2016. Okay. The testosterone levels at the bottom or the, the bottom of the next okay, page. Okay, so inter- so and it actually, I'll, I think this is the full blood profile. This is, and the, out of the gate, this makes me feel better because they at least were checking for. And it's funny, I can look on here, see who the referring doctor was. I know who was checking and what they were checking for. Yeah, like that all. That's all. So the data I my wife was introduced through through a you know a seminar, if you will. Okay. And noticing some things, you should probably go get this checked out. If nothing else would be good for you and all that, right? So here we are, and yeah, it's it, fact, right? This t- testosterone. So you are going to lose, I mean, and it's measured nanogram per deciliter. You're going to lose slowly as you age. However, quick before we jump to this, I'll even give a little story as to myself. So I'm 40 and the residency fellowship medical school training process, it's like Mm. indentured servitude. Life sucks. You don't sleep. You don't eat. When I finished like five years ago, I put on 20 pounds over about six months of muscle. I feel like a human because at the time I was like just this like locked in the dungeon type. You know, and that's yeah. not a good thing. I would never endorse that, but that's just the game. That's the game you play. Right. So I actually had my testosterone checked when I was 32 in the middle of residency, thinking I should feel better. And it was lowish. It wasn't low to the point where, where insurance would cover it, which is next to never. But it was like, you know, from on a scale from zero to 10, it was like a one yeah. to two. Right. Now, being now six, seven, eight years older, exercising, eating healthy, I was able to naturally get my testosterone level to climb to like around the 500-ish, from around 300-ish. Naturally. Just naturally, yeah. just by living better. Yeah, exercise mine was basically exercise will do it. Yeah, so, and I'm looking at that number here. You were at 395, but I'm guessing- but that's low for a 36-year-old, right, or no? It is low, it's low for an any one-year-old, but especially for yeah. a 36-year-old. Okay. So now this right here, and this is on Westpac Lab, but all labs have their own range of, and it's not a normal range, it's really the range that you would expect to see that, it's a standard range or a reference range. Okay. Theirs is 241 to 827 nanogram per deciliter. You were at 395. Now, I will give this physician the order of the blood work credit because they also checked the sex hormone binding globulin, which is the it's the main protein besides albumin and others that carry testosterone. They checked your free testosterone, which was also quite low. Right. So that right there corroborates that that total testosterone is actually a true reliable number that we can base everything on. Okay. And everything else actually was pretty reasonably in there. They checked everything else, PSA for prostate, vitamin D, B12, the LHFSH, the, te- the testicular function. Yeah. So give them credit, boxes checked, done right. So looking at this right here at a 395, and their reference range is 241 to 827. I usually say three to eight. That's the lab core quest kind of standard range. So I could look at you and say with high level of confidence on the right dosing of testosterone at the right frequency, you could go from feeling not so hot to feeling way better. Mm-hmm. But then the real question is, well, what bothers you? And for some, for most guys, it's energy is low. For some, it's erectile dysfunction or like sex drive, libido is low. And that's sometimes why the wives kick him in. Other times it's they're just grouchy train wrecks. And yeah. the wife's like, something's got to give, go get checked out. Because it could be your thyroid, yours was fine. It could be other things, you know, it could be anemic, yours was fine. But that's why we check all of the above out of the gate. Right. But for some guys, it's, you know, I want to put on more lean muscle mass. For some, they say I have this huge gut, I want to lose it. I want to yeah. burn more fat. I mean, testosterone doesn't burn fat, but it does just get you able to work out better, which then gets you to burn more fat. And it does have some indirect effects. Yeah. But that's why we were talking before, kind of that like fitness world, it does mesh so well with this because mm-hmm. you can get to a point where you're eating like kale and raw chicken, or not raw chicken, but cooked bland chicken or just like raw fish. And you're like, I've only got to this point of optimization. We say, well, maybe the hormones are an issue. We can optimize that too. So using you as an example, if you're at 395 with a month or two of uh, testosterone injections, we could get you up to like seven, 800. I personally don't want to have my level so abnormal that I'm like that guy at the Gold's gym who's like carrying TVs under his arm. Right. Yeah, no thanks. And this isn't meant to be just like a quick fix. It's meant to be a lifestyle. But also more testosterone does bring on more aggression too, right? Or, potentially. Or I mean, roid rage is real, varies but you were talking like through the roof levels. We're right. talking that guy that's like in no way natural, like 
I mean, you look at him and he's like freaking you out. Yeah. So like, what's the difference between, you know, true testosterone injections as a medical response to low testosterone versus, you know, anabolic steroids and these cocktails? Technically the same thing. Now with the cocktails and anabolic steroids, there's other things like D-ball and other stuff that you can right. throw in. You can throw in growth hormone if you're looking to really, you know, help with joint recovery, muscle tissue recovery, and also kind of bulk up more. That is a different thought process, quite a bit more expensive. It's a biologic, not just a controlled substance. But like for, testosterone for itself is not, not expensive per se. No, right? it's not. It's more the, how do you get it? Are you getting the right dose? Are you getting it the right way at the right frequency? Are you being monitored? Like I've had patients that have been on testosterone for a year and they're like, I don't feel better. I'm like, but you've been doing this for a year. Like that's kind of like driving without a speedometer, Yeah. you know, or like how fast am I going? I don't know. I'm just going on the freeway. Like that doesn't fit my OCD. So I'm no. like, no, 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 pause. Let's recheck your counts. Let's see where you're at. Let's see where we can go. Right. Um, so I'll use an example. I just, I have a patient, he's fifth. D2, just started him on testosterone about three months ago. And his level was about yours. He was at 370. Felt good. I mean, working out every day, feeling good, but knew he could do better. And I was like, yeah, you can. So we got him up to 700 after about two months. And he comes in with his wife and he's like, I feel amazing. I'm blowing out all the young kids at the gym, on the rower, on the battle ropes. He said, can I do better? And I'm like, well, yeah, do you want to? He's like, I do. So we just kept getting his levels a little higher. He'll probably cap out around a thousand. So at that high end, if the reference range is 200, 300 to 800, I like to have people around that 8,000, maybe 1,200, 800 to 1,200 range. It's not normal, but then again, like it's kind of, I look at this kind of like your bank account balance, you know, like there's no such thing as too much. I mean, I guess there is if you're sacrificing like your family and your life and everything, I guess, you know, greedy is not a good thing, but a little more is usually a good thing within reason. Yeah. You know, it's not like you get above 800 and we're like, oh crap, where's the side effect? No, you can have people with side effects at a, a lower number. And that's why the monitoring is so huge. I right. just don't like to do it off the cuff. Yeah. Like those guys that are getting their testosterone out of the trunk of a car behind the gym in, at age 22, no thanks. And I have a couple of them where they jacked their body up and it's a game of repair, recover. And sometimes there's irreversible harm done. So that's the whole goal is to avoid that, to do it right. And it's not something that you're destined to do for the rest of your life. You can start, you can see how you feel. Like I have a patient who his, his level was actually 770 on this same range. So he's actually high end of normal. He's like, can I try it and see if I feel better? And I say, yes, you safely can. Give it three, four, five, six months. If you notice no difference, well, at least you tried it. Mm -hmm. But that's a different thought process than someone like you who's 395. And I'm guessing this was five years ago. You're probably now in the, well, I don't know, mid threes. Mm -hmm. So the benefit is all the greater potentially. Right. So the medical options that I have, you're doing or advocating testosterone injections. Correct. But there's pellet therapy. Totally. What about these ointments? So all of them there's are great trochies, options. trochies, you know, yeah, lozenges. You can, throw, you can throw a little lozenge in your cheek. And I mean, it's an option. The pellets are actually good. The problem is, I mean, they can be removed, but technically it's not as easy to modulate, right? This has a very, so take testosterone sipionate, which is the most commonly used injection. It comes in a little grape seed oil or sunflower seed oil base. Yeah. You pull it up into the syringe, you wipe a little spot on your butt, you grab the muscle and you inject it, or you have your wife or a significant other, whatever, inject. So but that- you, Then you get a response, which will peak you do the get testosterone. A response. So that, that peaks around day four or five, and then okay. starts to come down. By the time you're injecting on day seven, you've had a little bit of an up and down, but it's not a peak trough. Now that's a one week roughly. There's some guys that have injecting twice a week because they feel on that day six, they're like, I start to feel like I'm falling off a cliff again. I'm like, great. Well, you're supposed to, you need to dose twice a week. Are they really that acutely aware? Well, the lower, this is the crazy part. The lower the number, the more they see the benefit and the more acutely where they are. So even if I'm doing this now, like three, four, five, six months in, I started with a number not as low, so I might not get as much benefit. It's that same thing. Like if this is what you're looking for and you're starting here, that's a big discrepancy. You're going to notice it with a lot more, you know, tangible physical evidence. If you start here, you can improve, but that improvement is not as stark. So the thing, so like doing the ointment or the cream, or in this case, I like to use kind of a lotion based. The problem is it's a little harder to meter because it's a pump. A pump isn't quite as accurate. Right. I get it from compound, I have multiple pharmacies that I've created relationships with because it's a controlled substance. Right. And then I'll prescribe that to patients. I personally think the convenience aspect matters almost more than anything else. So I view it as safe, effective, like overseen correctly, right. blood work, maintenance, everything, and then convenient. Because I mean, we'll have guys that leave their dry cleaning at the 
dry cleaner for six weeks, eight weeks before they pick it up. Right. Because they just got busy. Yeah, yeah. You know, totally. stuff like that happens. Yeah. Or, 100%. you know, the car's making a noise and you just it didn't explode. Okay, got to go to work. Yeah. So if it's not convenient, then I'm out. So I've created the platform where we do all the blood work we do. Then you come in, we have the consult, we chat about what your goals, expectations are, start you on the therapy right then and there, a nice little nondescript box with all the syringes, needles, sharps, containers, product, everything. And that way, and then we ship it to you. So you don't have to even think about it. You just open the door. It's right there. I mean, you, you, can't, the, you can't screw it up. That's great. Hmm, interesting. So you get how much, how much time frame do I have out of the convenience? In other words, how many injections do I get? Or I get one at a time? You, no, you, no, you usually about a month's worth. Oh. I give you a month at a time. Okay, so three usually, or four at a time. So like if we start, let's just say Scott popped in today. This was the consultation. I look at you say, dude, we can get the benefit. We'd go over the whole risk benefit, everything. I mean, your prostate was checked. You know, your thyroid also is good. We talk about, you know, little things like you have a family history of stroke or heart disease, mm-hmm. um, you know, all of the above. Yeah. And then we'd go get into here's the benefit we're looking to get. Right. And whether it's like I mentioned, sex drive improvement, you know, erectile dysfunction improvement, just more energy, getting rid of brain fog, more skeletal muscle mass, burning a little fat, just doing a little bit better in the gym. Or sometimes it's, sometimes patients can't say X, Y, or Z improved. They just say, I feel better, but I can't put my finger on what? Right. I just feel better. Like I had a patient who his wife was like, you're just less like short tempered with the kids. Right. It's like, oh, I'll take it. You know, and then there's the other little intangible benefits. So if we looked at that, I'd, we'd start the shots and then I'd say in nine weeks to 11 weeks, let's recheck. Let's see if you're 395 bumped to 500 or 700 or 1,000. And all the while you're determining how you feel because you're pretty self-aware. You're not going to delude yourself that you're improving when you're not. So then let's just say your number is around 800. You're like, I feel great. Right. And the answer is, well, we can get you a little higher. We can live there. How do you want this to go? And then, so it's really patient driven. And that's where pellets or something come in that's longer lasting. Right. You put a pellet in, which is like a little grain of rice in your butt, and it's a slow release version of testosterone. Someone's like, I can't do needles. No thanks on that. Can I do the cream? And I say, sure, but ideally it's completely dry. You put one pump, you leave that area unexposed for 10 minutes. Your kid comes give you a hug. Your wife, you're like, ah, don't touch me. Right. So of there's course. a convenience yeah, that's factor. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, cr- the cream works great for some patients. I mean, I'm a fan of shot. Next week, think about it again. I'm done. Like right. out of sight, out of mind. Do a shot and walk away. Yeah. So you said it's convenience factor. So it is. It's finding that. And convenience. it's more medically controlled. It is because that way I can dose you for like. So if it's 200 milligrams per mL, I can then say, okay, are you going to be 0.5, you know, of an mL, which would be 100 milligrams? Are you going to be 0.55, 0. 0.6? Do you do it every seven days, every six? Do you know what I mean? There's a lot more to ability to in. modulate. So side effects. So long term side. Let's start with the long term side effects of me not doing anything and having low testosterone. You just feel like butt. You do. I mean. Yeah. But now there you are. Okay. Like, so now let's say I long term side effects of having too much testosterone in my body. I've read articles about you know cancer causing this or these so, effects on so that. So it's not really a cancer causing thing. For a while, it was a oh my gosh, is prostate or a higher likelihood worsen. you develop cancer. Yeah. So maybe? growth growth hormone potentially, but it's okay. not even more likely to develop cancer. More likely, it's can does growth hormone make everything grow, including cancer? Yes. So the screening for for growth hormone patients is a little bit different. It's more a little bit more in depth for testosterone, not so much. For testosterone, there is a short window the first couple of weeks of having like a change in your sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea, it could worsen a little. Is that because of body mass or body habitus change? We don't know. How about someone that like has an elevated PSA? Well, technically the prostate is very sensitive to testosterone being right there around the testicles in the male area. So I would send that patient to their urologist to get their PSA checked out. Do they have benign prostatic issues or do they have prostate cancer? I have a patient right now who came in, his prostate PSA was like 10.7 normal range like yours is below four. And I said, up, pause, no testosterone for you. You go to get the urologist and he's going to get a little biopsy and we'll get him on it at some point. But that's part of the reason why the blood testing is so Did he have prostate cancer? We don't know. We don't know. He's getting the biopsy here soon. We'll find out. But the point being, we got to be really cautious to not just throw crap at you without knowing that we're doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. Um, It does increase your blood counts a little. So your red blood cell count will climb. Technically a slight stroke increased risk. But it's more if your blood cell count climbs, you kind of feel sluggish and crappy. That was one patient. He was on testosterone for a year and a half. He's like, why do I feel like crap? But we did a blood work, a blood check. And I'm like, um, you're going to the Red Cross today. You're donating a unit therapeutically. Here's your doctor's note. And then he felt better. And it's like, well, it's a wow. side effect of. But that's one of those things that you see with unmonitored and it's not optimized testosterone therapy or hormone therapy. 
I mean, I would think if 800, let's say if, if 800 is the optimal number, wouldn't I live a more healthy, longer life if that's where I live? You would make an argument. You would make an argument. That so yes. let, I'm low testosterone. I start taking this. I go on for a year. My body, does it stop? Now, now my brain is not producing testosterone okay, so and I stop and I fall off. Yes and what no. Okay. So I will start all of my male patients on HCG at the same point. That's the same HCG that is the urine, che- urine test checks for yep. when a woman's pregnant. But when you inject the HCG, it kind of tricks your, your brain and your body a little bit into continuing to create your own natural testosterone. Okay. So it prevents the testicular atrophy or shrinking nuts that we don't want. Right. And it's just nice to have on there at the same time. It's injected twice a week, just in the skin, quick, easy. And that's just because I don't want you to stop in six months or a year and your body has to then get back into its own groove of creating your own testosterone. Our bodies are pretty efficient. They know if you're shooting something in your butt that it makes, it's like, I'm out. You know, someone else is digging the ditch. I'm going to take a break. Right. So we don't want to mandate that you use it forever by getting you kind of accustomed to it. I like to keep your own natural testosterone production as high as possible. That way we're augmenting it. And you can jump off it. So the with HCD, a little bit more. HCG, HCG helps, helps that. that. Yeah. So that's one of those little things. Or some guys are, are deficient in vitamin B. So I have a B complex that will add on. Some they're like, hey, I work out like crazy. I need to get my mitochondrial function up. I'll put them on like a methionine and acetylcholine or a MYC complex that we add. There's a lot of little variables. And that's that optimization. Wow. And it's not, it's not that it's hard stuff. It's just doing it right. It right. sounds crazy. But there's so many males and females, but more males in this case, where they're like, oh, yeah, I want to get jacked. I want to do it. I'm like, whoa, pause. Yeah, wait. What's the reason can't be to just get jacked. Yeah, exactly. What's the, what's the, now. Like I'm working out six days a week and I've been doing that for however long. I don't see any development in my body. That's maybe a different reason. Agreed. Yeah. And so that's why in our market, kind of like you were talking about, kind of your your target demographic My back squat is, has stayed 295 for the last four years. What can I do? This is baloney. So this is something we can add to. But that's that same concept, and it goes along with fitness. To just throw someone on testosterone, nothing else changing, they'll feel better. But it's not like they're going to just like turn into like, you know, the most amazing physiqued male in overnight. No, it's a, it's a combination, healthy diet. I mean, like I mentioned, I was able to get my own testosterone level up like 200 points. Wow. Just, just with, by diet, just diet. Well, and, and, and any other over the and counter, a lot, no, no over the counter, no, nothing. nothing. And this is, a, this is eight years later, just exercising regularly, like putting on muscle mass, like a lot of, because muscle you know, mass good. in and of itself, lean muscle mass will help promote will. development. Yep. Of, oh. So that's why a lot of like a lot of articles are read foods, though, certain foods, certain foods will. So a lot of articles are read, like you go to men's health and it's like natural ways to boost your testosterone. I mean, you can get the deer antler crap and rub it on your body. Right, right. Sure. I guess why not? But you could also, you know, exercising alone, lean muscle mass increasing, like those things that you, you metric out, you'll see an improvement, but you'll go from maybe on a scale from zero to 10, you'll go from maybe a one to a three. Well, I don't want to be a three. Right. I want to be a 10. Yeah. As long as it's safe, I'm in. I want to optimize. That's it. So that's the goal. That's the whole concept. So adding that in, and interestingly, um, that the whole goal for creating that as a separate branch or, or brand to my surgical practice was, because I'll, I'll have male patients come in, I'll do like their eyelids or I'll do Botox filler and I'll do their hormone therapy or I'll do the wife's Botox or filler. So I, I was thinking about this the other day. It's kind of like the male... Botox filler, if you think about it, like a lot of guys in our world, they're like, oh yeah, my wife gets Botox. Well, what do you do? Nothing. Well, this is kind of in that world. Mm. Can I do something that's safe with a reasonable return on investment that I'm not, you know, destined to do for life that I can try and see how I feel? Yes, you can. Yeah. Next. I want to look this up because I've got a buddy who was taking, you know, he, he was trying to take the um, natural over the counter approach, right? And there's one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven, twelve different. In twelve the, different that popped up on the initial Google search. There's five thousand six hundred twelve. No, no, no. Th- this is his protocol. Oh, oh, twelve things he's taking. Yes, Sign for me different out, things. Okay, so, so no way. That's yeah, just, no, no. Some of them are just normal kind of like you increase know, kale, multivitamins, multi- things like sure. this. But think, but you know, there's definitely testosterone boosters there. And I looked into that, like specifically testosterone boosters. There's so many. I'll get of at them. least one guy a day at the gym that asks me. He's how like, do you, how do you feel about this? I'm like, I mean, and how much is it? So if you look at it, dollar bill, it's like three times the cost of doing testosterone therapy. Um, no thanks. Right. Or inconvenient. I have to like get because I, it's quote unquote maybe touted as all natural, but how do you really know if it is? Well, I mean, or testosterone it is natural. It's in your body. This is just a synthetic version of what it's like. Someone taking thyroid hormone when they have hypothyroidism. No different. 
someone doing insulin injection when they have diabetes. No different. Mm. It's taking your natural body's produced something synthetically created and then injecting it. And the best part is it's not something you're on for life. Most guys are on it for a long freaking time because they feel better. Right. That's the goal. Right. It's an interesting thing, though. It's a really... It really is. The, uh, the science behind it. And it lends well for that kind of fitness, health conscious so culture do you like th- ours. Do you think that technology will continue to innovate where... Whether or not it's an injection or something else I mean, that's like just the pr- more. The, there is, so like if you could take a pill, that'd be great. But the problem is there's really high what we call liver first pass metabolism. You eat or you take that little pill. As soon as it gets absorbed in your bloodstream, it's gone. Right. Like your liver metabolizes 78% of it in one four minute window. Well, that's worth it. Well, that would apply the same with those like just like a like a testosterone trochee or something so like that. So those you put in your, put like in your cheek for yeah. three hours and it's right. a time delivery. It's like wearing a patch, like a, like a nicoderm type patch. Right. The nicotine sits and it absorbs slowly. Interesting. Well, there's no difference between that patch on the skin or the cream that gets absorbed over a, you know, suggested amount of time in a shot other than the shot is a needle. Wow. And I mean, to be brutally honest, most people when given the choice, they'd rather do it once a week with a little baby needle and not think about it again. Yeah. I mean, because you look at it, what if you're sweatier today or what if it's hotter outside or the humidity changes? Well, that'll, you're getting instead of 100 milligrams, this dose, you're getting 150 or 70. There's more variability. Mm. I don't like variability. I want it to be, I'm a surgeon. I right. want it how I want it, when I want it, you know, reliably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Wow. Isn't this good stuff? It is. It really is. Well, we've taken about an hour. Oh, I appreciate your time. Flew I thought we by. had three. I know. What's the seriously. deal? Like, come on. We could keep going, but... but <laughs> now, Scott, thank you. This is one of hopefully many more to come. Hey, we well, got we plenty of time. Dive in more to maybe some fitness and some other nutrition. Fitness and nutrition would be fantastic. Bring it. All right. We'll plan it. Thank you for coming in. You're welcome. This was Thanks very enlightening. Me. And now we can get you going. That's the best part. Uh, now, now we're going to get your you Botox. We're going to get rid of the eyelid skin. We're going to optimize your moly. home. You are, you're like poster Here child. Here we go. It just cost me thousands of dollars. Overnight. Right? But I will look fantastic. Amazing. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much, man.